Hello Solar Eclipse Timer users. This is Dr. Telepin checking in with you. This is it. This is the subject that I've been waiting to discuss with you. The king of the partial phase phenomena, shadow bands. I love shadow bands. After the last eclipse, there are dozens of new videos on the internet showing shadow bands. In this episode, we talk about when, where, and why we get to see shadow bands. Observe for shadow bands. My story about shadow bands begins in December of 2002 when I saw them for the first time at an eclipse in Zimbabwe, Africa. It was so exciting. They were amazing to see. I did not have a shadow bands video camera recording, but in this video clip, you can hear someone in our group call out shadow bands at about 60 seconds before C2, and then hear all of the excitement about seeing them. This is the eclipse where I used the first version of my talking solar eclipse timer, and you can hear it call out the times. Here's the clip. Yep, there they go. Oh, yeah. Look at her. 60 seconds. 60 seconds. 60 seconds. Look at them. Jim? That's amazing. Shadow bands. Did you see them? The view of those shadow bands from that eclipse is ingrained in my memory. I remember that they had a complex motion. They seemed to be serpentine in shape and fluttered. The serpentine shapes were in parallel rows, and the fluttering or alternating light and dark images made them look like they were moving away from me. But in addition, the entire group of rows moved in unison in a direction that was to my left. That is why in the eclipse video I did with Destin of Smarter Every Day, I described them as thousands of snakes moving away from me and to my left. What are shadow bands? It bends the light and causes motions of serpentine shadows across the ground that look like thousands of snakes crawling in unison. Shut up. In parallel. This is going away oh, from no you and to the side. It's unbelievable. I saw them in 2002. I think Destin really enjoyed the way I described the shadows I saw as moving snakes. But maybe he didn't believe me. What? Snakes? I thought an eclipse was like, you know, I'm going to look at... Th no. This is a real phenomenon. I've looked it up. Destin used the term shadow snakes in the title of that video, and that became a popular term on YouTube. I know that the video with Destin was instrumental in getting thousands of people to lay out white sheets at their observing sites to see shadow bands. Some of you captured great videos, better than what I got. I appreciate what Destin did, and I am happy that I was able to educate people and help them enjoy the eclipse. To prepare to document shadow bands during the 2017 eclipse, I knew I had to analyze my observations from 2002. I used the interactive eclipse map for that eclipse combined with my site videos to recreate the observation. Here is the path for that eclipse. The angle of the path exit was about 130 degrees. The sun azimuth was about 100 degrees. I remember the row movement direction was a bit to my left, making that direction about 90 degrees. Here is the observation site. North and the Umbra exit direction are marked. This is an overlay of how I remember the shadow bands with an arrow showing the direction of the band motion or flutter. This is the direction of the movement of the rows in unison. So, when preparing for 2017, I wondered about all of these interrelationships, the path angle, the sun azimuth, the sun altitude, and the atmospheric effects. Is there a link to the path direction? I wanted to try to advance the understanding of shadow bands. We need to start by talking about when you see shadow bands during a total solar eclipse. We will use my observing position for the example. As an observer on the ground, in the path, you are waiting patiently at your observing site as the eclipse moves across the surface of the Earth. You will have two opportunities to look down 
on the ground and witness shadow bands. The first is when the last sliver of sun is still present outside of the occulting moon, beginning about 90 seconds before C2. You have to start looking for them on the ground. My app will remind you to look for them. They will fade into view at some point and you will see them. Then they go away as it gets dark right before you go into totality. At this point, you enjoy totality. The second opportunity occurs just after totality with the sliver of sun reappearing from behind the moon after C3. Shadow bands will appear slightly more abruptly and may be visible for 60 to 90 seconds. My app will remind you to look at this point also. Then the shadow bands will fade away. I want you to appreciate the complexity of this partial phase phenomena. These are very low contrast patches of fluttering shapes of light gray color. So there's another condition that must be met to see shadow bands. It has to be dark enough to see them. Let me repeat this point because it is never discussed in context. I want to emphasize that two things are happening simultaneously for shadow bands to be visible. At C2, there's the obligate sliver of light forming, and the progressive thinning of the sliver is, in turn, decreasing the ambient light. This evolving combination is creating the special 90-second window of time where you can witness this very unique phenomena before going into totality. After totality, at C3, the sliver of light quickly reappears and it is still dark enough to see shadow bands. But the sliver slowly becomes wider, allowing too much ambient light to the ground and the low contrast shadow bands are no longer visible. Your 90 second time limit runs out. But to understand things better, let me demonstrate what is happening from the space perspective. The moon is casting its shadow on the earth as the moon moves across the sun and the earth rotates. Now picture looking down on yourself at an observing position a couple of minutes before C2. This image demonstrates the column of light created by the moon causing a sliver of exposed sun that precedes C2 always right in front of the umbra as it moves along. When this column of light is passing over your observing position, you have your first opportunity to see shadow bands. This is right before the umbra will move over you. Then after totality, after C3, the column of light trails the moving umbra. This is the second opportunity for you to see shadow bands because the conditions are the same as just before C2. So based on what I just explained, I want you to have a new appreciation for the diagrams of the path of an eclipse. Don't look at the path diagram as only about seeing totality. Look at the path diagram as a moving group of three entities, the preceding column of light, totality, and the trailing column of light. All three of these entities pass over all observing positions in the path. That is why you have the sequence of shadow bands, totality, shadow bands. So we've looked at the ground perspective and the space perspective. Now let's look at the sliver of sun close up. Here are two image captures from a video that I took at the eclipse in 2006. The left image is exactly 60 seconds before C2 and the right image is exactly 60 seconds after C3. So this is during the time of prime shadow band creation. Look at the size and the shape of the sun sliver. It almost no longer fits the definition of a crescent. It is almost a straight sliver of light. Not only is it thin, it is shorter. This is the sliver of light that is causing the column of light before C2 and after C3. Look at the image simulation. If the average angular diameter of the sun is around 32 arc minutes, look at the decrease in the arc minutes at 60 seconds before C2. The exact dimension is not crucial here. My point is that the size and shape of this sliver, which coincides with the period of shadow band creation, is relatively constant for all eclipses through time. So that was a detailed discussion on the conditions that must be met to see shadow bands. But now you're asking, okay, but what actually causes them to form? 
I would say that the accepted theories right now all involve the sliver of light being altered by the atmosphere at some height above the Earth's surface. The question is, at what altitude in the atmosphere? The atmosphere is complex and variable, and its effects can differ from site to site. The atmosphere also changes between day and night. The refractive power of the atmosphere decreases with increasing altitude. The effect may be high altitude scintillation, like what causes the twinkling of stars. But these theories are based on point sources like stars. The narrowing crescent is certainly not a point source. The effect could be at a different level in the atmosphere, maybe around the levels that affect seeing when observing planets. It could be somewhere in between. Others think the effect is created at lower levels, the level of the thermal eddies in the convective boundary layer. But I don't believe the effect is this low. This level would have tremendous variability, but yet shadow band videos through time over a wide range of sites are actually quite consistent. Remember this space perspective of the column of light traveling through space at C2? The light will reach Earth, but it contacts the atmosphere first. In space, there is nothing to alter the light but the atmosphere is denser and complex and will alter the light. My belief is the effect is created in the mid to upper levels of the troposphere, at some sweet spot where the Earth's atmosphere begins to get dense enough to refract by having layers of temperature gradients and where the winds are located. Gas in motion, but at the same temperature, would not affect light. The upper atmosphere has thin layers of air at varying temperatures, and cooler air is denser. So as the sliver of light passes through the air of varying densities, the light is refracted or bent. This is happening to the light from the sun's sliver for an infinite amount of positions in the turbulent atmosphere. It results in the alternating light gray patches of shadows on the ground. I took this picture of a laser light penetrating a piece of plastic. As the laser light enters the denser plastic medium, a change in the direction of the propagation is introduced. This is the same concept as light meeting an interface of denser, cooler air, but at a much smaller scale of refraction. Another conceptual example often used is how waves of water on the surface of a pool create focused and defocused patterns on the bottom of the pool. The water is a denser medium and the surface causes refraction of the sunlight. I've always thought that if this example is not clarified, it can be confusing to people regarding shadow bands because with a pool, the light source the sun is a round disk and the waves on the surface of the water where the refraction occurs is random. If I were using this concept to explain shadow bands, I would alter the view of the patterns on the bottom of the pool to look like this. Because the light source is now the sliver of sun and the motion in the upper atmosphere will be more linear. So the pool bottom pattern would now have elongated shadow band shapes aligned in rows. The fluttering we see in shadow bands is due to their formation by the turbulent atmosphere. The appearance of rows is due to the light source being that sliver of sun we talked about. Now, there are observer experiences, including me in the past, of not seeing shadow bands at a location. I really wonder why that is. My first thought is they weren't looked for properly, or at least not at the right time. 90 seconds before C2 is a very exciting time, and most people are looking up. You have to force yourself to look down, and that is why I have the reminder in the app. My second thought is that the background at the observing position was too dark or too textured for the shadow bands to be visible. And perhaps the section of atmosphere that is affecting the observing location is remarkably stable or has light cloud cover. I suspect they occur most of the time. You just have to know how and when to look for them. And my app will remind you. Let's review why we see shadow bands. The sun becomes a sliver of light. The atmosphere does its magic. You are in the path. Your ambient light is low enough. 
your background is white and smooth, you remember to look for them both times. Finally, based on my analysis of shadow ban video obtained from three sites during the 2017 eclipse, I suggest that we give great importance to the effect of the upper atmosphere winds being the driving force for the motion and movements we see on the ground. This will be the subject of another shadow ban episode. Thank you for watching this Solar Eclipse Timer episode. I hope you learned something about shadow bands and now share my enthusiasm for observing shadow bands. They are the king of the partial phase phenomena. If you find my work helpful, please subscribe by clicking the subscribe button below. Also click on the little bell that will pop up. That will make sure you are notified when I release new episodes about solar eclipses. Share the video with friends and post comments and questions. If you don't feel like subscribing, that's fine. Just check in on this channel and go to my website because my goal is to be your best resource to prepare for solar eclipses. Thanks again. I appreciate your time.